Hello and welcome to another episode of Lead In, a series where I preview products that I'm going to subsequently review on Soundstage Australia, uh, the full formal written review. Okay, today I'm going to talk to you about a Tasmanian company called Pitt and Giblin, run by Ross Giblin and Jack Pitt, two really switched on uh, young guys. Uh, obviously, the company is relatively young and it's a loudspeaker specialist. They've got two models, the Super Wax Mini, which is the entry point, and I'll be looking at the Super Wax, which is the flagship speaker from the company. Now, it's an interesting design. It's a retro, cool, massive enclosure uh, featuring, uh, it's a three-way, and it's got a one-inch exit polyamide tweeter in a very unusual and unique waveguide, and it's fashioned out of bronze, um, it, there's quite an involved process in producing this, this waveguide, not only in the mechanics of actually building it, and, and each waveguide is, is actually unique because of the procedure that's involved in, in making this, but uh, there's, uh, the Pitt Pen Gibbon has spent a lot of R&D and a lot of time developing a specific waveguide uh, shape and pattern, if you like, um, which has a very uh, even uh, response and it coheres with the other drivers and um, it's it's something that actually blends in really really well um, with the 10 inch mid-range driver which itself has a aluminium cast basket and uh, neodymium uh, magnum motor and the twin low 15 inch low frequency drivers uh, they're all paper cones aside from the twitter of course uh, with folded surrounds, um, so they're light and they're fast. And now the thing that actually makes this even more powerful is that it's a, an active speaker and it has a Hypex amplifier uh, on the rear of the cabinet. Uh, you can feed it uh, an analog signal via your preamp, if you like, or you can feed it directly from your DAC, or you can even just stream to it. Um, the speakers connect to each other via SPDIF, uh, so it's not a mess of cables, it's actually a, a, a fairly uh, quick solution uh, all in one uh, for people who just want to basically open a, an app on the phone and pre press go. But it, you, if you want to go deeper than that uh, and kind of integrate the speakers into a part of your audio file or enthusiast audio system, quality audio system, you can also do that. So the twin 15-inch drivers are supported by obviously the amplification which is ideally matched to it uh, and twin very large twin reflex ports on the rear of the enclosure the enclosure itself is massive with a large internal volume to support the drivers uh, but it's braced uh, it's birch ply construction uh, and the mid-range driver has its own dedicated sub enclosure within the the main cabinet now there's a lot to talk about this waveguide because it's, it's actually quite special. It's not uh, specified in just a degree of uh, or degrees of dispersion, but it's a very specific design. And I actually had uh, Ross and Jack visit uh, a day or so ago, and we had a quick chat. And I'm going to include our conversation, which was specifically about the the necessity of including DSP for this particular wave. Uh, guide uh, construction or design. Um, so uh, we'll be talking to uh, Ross and Jack in the next section of the of this lead-in episode. Uh, so can you tell me a little bit about how the waveguide uh, came about, the material used as well, and how, 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 how did this whole thing come about? So the waveguide design started as a, a study of the the optimal way to produce a consistent in-room response. <laughs> so a combination of direct sound from the speaker to the listener and also the, all the reflections in, in the room <laughs> that are inherent in any room. It's very much designed with DSP in mind. So the fact that the, the waveguide profile, or the, the shape of the waveguide profile results in a non-flat frequency response but is designed for a very consistent power response. Um, with with real kind of drive units, you can't achieve those two things together. Right. Um, basically, the the DSP allows us to correct frequency in phase to keep our consistent power response, but still achieve a flat on axis frequency response. Right. So the tonal balance in room is is consistent wherever you're sitting, and also 
the the balance of the reflected sound is consistent with the direct sound. Right. Um, so the profile, the the precision of the profile is is critical in um, in achieving that, and the repeatability is critical in, mm. in achieving that, making sure that every every unit sounds the same. Right. Um, so we've We've done all of our waveguided iterations primarily out of timber with our CNC machine. Um, so lots of software iterations following with hardware iterations and then back into software. So lots, lots of, of prototyping. Yep. A lot of prototyping. So yeah, um, several thousand software iterations. And I think this is about the 20th iteration of, of this design um, physically. And then the casting kind of followed on from that after a bit of a, an investigation of the, the most reproducible way to manufacture this pattern um, right. plus we just really like the look of it sure sure and i'm wondering out of curiosity what were the things that you were aiming for in between each prototype version so what were you looking at okay this needs to improve so we need to redo this as a, as a new prototype what, what were you looking for so at the start it started as a uh, sort of theoretical study into what was sort of perceived as ideal um, and so initially, the very first few iterations was just correlating the software model with measurements of the hardware model, yeah. The, the, yeah, the physical driver and waveguide combination. Once we achieved the, the correlation between the two, then it's a combination of measurements uh, in free space, listening in rooms, listening in various kind of different spaces, um, measurements in different spaces, um, and figuring out kind of pros and cons and kind of coming up with a a clear correlation between subjective um, impressions and an objective ideal. Um, right. Basically, once we've got, or once we kind of define what that objective ideal looks like, then we can uh, can iterate in software, following that iterate in hardware to get as close to that as we can. Was there ever a conflict between um, what you were aiming for in terms of the prototype and, and, and the measurements and what you were hearing? No, mm, okay. no. I think we, we just got closer and closer to you know, once we'd sort of kind of clarified exactly what we were trying to achieve objectively, mm -hmm. every time we, we iterated and got closer to that, it subjectively improved as well. Okay. Also, our measurement techniques improved as well. So uh, there's a big learning curve in not only um, modelling, manufacturing and listening to the device, but also figuring out a, out a way for it to be measured using, using um, a rig, essentially. Yeah. So we've developed uh, a system now mm -hmm. that we can confidently measure things right. and know that it will translate to things that are subjectively better, sure. better sure. tropes in the, in the device. Okay. So you obviously have a, a, a very large space where you can measure and it's almost kind of most of, or? Yeah, most of our stuff is just measured in free space. Right. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So we just um, we use a system where we essentially remove the loudspeaker or the, the, the source from the ground plane. We're lucky in Tasmania that our workshop's in a very secluded little kind of bush environment and we can get into a huge amount of free space a long way away from anywhere. Excellent. <laughs> it's a pretty ideal measurement environment. That's great. So with this in mind, um, in terms of pursuing something quite objective, what we were after was something in a, in a loudspeaker product that meant that people could enjoy it essentially straight out of the box. And that's part of the reason that we've chosen an active amplifier for this. Um, not only does the waveguide absolutely require DSP mm -hmm. uh, to function well, sure. um, Active gives us so many more, more benefits as well um, and really constraining the relationship between the amplifiers and the transducers and even down to the cable that we use consistently in our manufacturing. Sure. It just means that those variables aren't able to be, yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah, managed yeah, right. okay. um, and considered as well. Sure. A really important part of the packaging for us is that they're they're also easy to use because we don't um, we don't want to alienate people that don't necessarily um, have the familiarity with the, the technology and you know even understand the way that a signal chain works in a traditional hi-fi setup. Sure. We want people that love music to just be able to plug them in and like it's the simplest well, it's a simple when, cable going when, from the master yeah, to the and to, with, like, with streaming and everything these days uh, you can you can go home and you can fire up an app on your phone and, and stream music they'll turn on automatically you can have volume control from your phone exactly it's just all it's all very easy and so it facilitates more more people listening to more music more of the time and that's what it's about yeah. isn't it exactly, exactly. okay yeah. so i'm hoping that gave you a good overview of the super wax uh 
uh, loudspeaker and Pitt and Giblin as a company and Ross and Jack as, a, as the designers and the, as a team of, as a partnership of designers. Um, so watch out for the uh, upcoming review, the official review coming up in three or four weeks time or so. Uh, and like I said, this was a very, very uh, promising design in the first place and uh, it didn't disappoint. So watch out for the review and we'll see you at the next lead-in episode.